Isaac from Heritage Expeditions HQ here. Welcome to the first discussion in our Heritage Live series. Today we're sitting down to tap the genius of Aaron Russ and all things New Islands. Aaron is a commercial director and one of our most experienced expedition leaders. He grew up exploring New Zealand's subantarctic islands and even lived on the snares for six weeks over winter, studying Buller's albatross. Welcome, Aaron. It's awesome to have you here. Great. Thanks, Isaac. Pleased to, uh, to be here and uh, look forward to, uh, to joining everyone that's joining us this afternoon. You're in for a treat. <laughs> so we're going to start with a bit of a Q&A, and if you have any qu- questions, feel free to fire them over and we'll loop back to them at the end. Okay, I guess a good place to start, Aaron, would be is if you could paint us a picture and give us a bit of an overview of the Snares Islands. So I, I, I think the Snares are, are one of my um, my favourite islands. They're, um, um, as, you, as you know, with Heritage Expeditions, we have the, the opportunity to visit a, a lot of amazing, or I'd say uh, many of the most amazing islands in the world. And I think for me, the Snares are amongst my um, my personal favourites. The, uh, the Snares are really quite a, a small group of islands. They're, um, they're just about uh, two kilometres long um, by, by three in the other axis. So really quite um, axis. Um, so really quite small islands, um, but um, they're completely covered in, um, in wildlife and, and really quite rugged. So they, they sit to the south of, uh, of, of Stewart Island and... Um, I guess the the first impression is just the the kind of as you come in from the sea is the is the rugged coastline and the sort of a, sort of the the fact that they just emerge out of the uh, the, the southern ocean. But once you get closer, there's a and really start exploring. There's a lot of personality of the islands as um, as well. Right, and they sound like they are way off the tourist route. As uh, does anyone else go there? Pretty much not. The uh, the snares are, are New Zealand's. Closest um, sub-Antarctic islands, so they're the nearest ones to uh, to Stewart Island, being just 60 miles to the uh, the south. Um, but that's uh, a barrier that keeps most people away. And, and Heritage Expeditions is um, is really the uh, the main regular visitor to the uh, to the islands. In addition to, um, to some of the researchers that will um, and research work that we'll discuss um, shortly. Um, so they they very are much uh, islands to them to themselves. Awesome. And let's talk about that, that name, the snares. It sounds almost like a trap. It is. It, it is. <laughs> so the uh, the snares, and we actually do have islands, or well, they're um, they're now just rocks that are known as the uh, the traps further to the uh, the north. And um, the snares were were named the snares by um, by George Vancouver. He um, was sailing on an, an expedition, leaving from Southern um, Fiordland on his way towards Tahiti. Came around the other uh, south of the South Island and um, came upon the uh, upon the the snares, as he uh, as he called them, because of their ability to ensnare um, uh, unwary uh, navigators, and um, actually his uh, his other the other ship on the same expedition um, was commanded by Broughton, and we have now Broughton Island at the uh, the snares, and um, Broughton saw the islands a couple of hours later than Vancouver named them the uh, the knights, but the snares has uh, has stuck um, because um, Vancouver was the uh, was the first, so. Luckily, they haven't actually, um, despite their name, ensnared too many um, <laughs> ships over the uh, over the years, and they're well charted on the on the maps these days. But they definitely have that potential. Excellent. So they're pretty hostile then, yet they remain a world-renowned um, wildlife haven. Why is that? I mean, I guess the, the, the islands are, I mean, their placement is, is a little hostile for, for navigators sitting to the south of, uh, of Stewart Island there. Um, the, the ocean that surrounds them is the, uh, is the Southern Ocean, so it's the, uh, the, has a, has a reputation for, uh, for good reason, for, for being a little hostile on occasions, but they are incredibly, uh, rich wildlife islands, and I think it's, it's really because of that ocean that's around them, most of the wildlife that's on the islands and calls the islands, um, home of, of, of species which are coming to those islands. To breed, so they're uh, they're returning to the snares each year for their uh, for their annual breeding. But it's the rich waters around the snares that really make the uh, the snares what they uh, they are in terms of of such a wildlife haven. And the uh, designated UNESCO World Heritage Site. What does that entail? So uh, the, the the UNESCO status is really a, a recognition um, by UNESCO of the uh, the significant status of the the snares um, and the the importance that they have. Internationally and globally, as um, as a wildlife preserve and, and a wildlife island, um, they're also afforded the the highest level of protection under New Zealand law in terms of um, conservation islands for protecting the the wildlife that are that's um, present on the island. And what sort of restrictions does that come with? 
So for the uh, for the snares, um, they have the, the like I say the highest level of protection, which means that the only um, people that are ever permitted permitted to land on the islands are um, are researchers, which are there to further the management of the uh, the species that are on the island. So um, they're um, they're islands which um, are amongst the few in the world that have never been modified by um, by humans, despite um, some of the early ex- expeditions visiting the islands. They haven't been introduced rats or stoats or plants even for um, for that matter. Matter so the uh, the islands retain that real pristine nature about them. And we're only able to zodiac cruise them, is that correct? Yeah. So because because the islands are so pristine and they have that such uh, that, that really high level of protection, um, when we visit with them um, with the ship, we zodiac cruise along the uh, the coastline, and it's uh, it's one of my favourite zodiac cruises anywhere in the world. It's an absolutely beautiful zodiac cruise, um, and it's a great coastline to explore by um, by sea. Um, in fact, the as we'll discuss, I had the uh, the opportunity to to explore the island by land. But I, I, having done that, I actually think that exploring by sea is is really the the way to uh, to explore the snares. The uh, the island itself is completely um, pockmarked, riddled with um, with petrol burrows. It's a very difficult island to uh, to move around on. But the uh, the zodiacs allow us to explore that um, that coastline and um, and really take in the the, the maximum amount of, of what the island has to offer. Yeah, I'm guessing there's parts that will be like completely off the like sheer cliffs, that sort of. Yeah, I mean, with a zodiac, you can sail right up under a sheer cliff. If you're on land, you can't um, exactly do the um, do the same. Um, there's some great sea caves that we um, we get into when we're, we're zodiacing around, and, and those are all completely inaccessible from from land. So the uh, the zodiacs really provide a, a means to uh, to explore the full full coastline, and and things like the uh, the snares crested penguins come right around the zodiacs. They're coming and going from the uh, from the island, and we're sitting just a, a few meters. Offshore and watching all the uh, all the action from the uh, the comfort and safety of the zodiacs. Ah, oh, so front row seats there. Exactly. <laughs> so on to the wildlife. Can you tell us a bit about what sort of wildlife we could expect to see and some of the flora as well from the safety of our zodiacs? Yeah. So the uh, the zodiacs um, really give us a, a window into the world of the uh, of the snares, and the snares has some um, has one of the highest degrees of endemism of all any of the subantarctic islands, despite the fact that it's quite um, close to the uh, to the mainland of New Zealand. Probably because of the fact that it's um, old continental um, granitic rock, which comprised the uh, the snares. There's a number of species that have been present there for for a long period of time and have evolved um, to be unique and found nowhere else other than on the snares. So probably the the most kind of iconic of all the uh, the species that you see as we uh, head out in the zodiacs are the snares crested penguins. Um, one of the Eudiptes penguins, the crested penguins, are found only on the snares. That's the only place in the world where they uh, where they breed. And um, we see them along the uh, the coastline in the waters offshore. But um, in addition to um, to that, um, there's the uh, the bullers albatross, which um, arrive around Christmas time each year and are breeding um, on the uh, the coast and, and across the uh, the snares. Um, in the waters around the snares, um, you you see large numbers of things like the sooty shearwaters and the soft plumage petrels, which are breeding in the um, in the burrows on the island. And then surprisingly enough, as we get in close, and there's actually Number of areas where we can even get in under the forest on the uh, the snares with the zodiacs, you start looking out for things like the endemic snares island um, tomtit and fernbird, which are small passerines that have again um, a subspecies or, or species that are unique to the um, to the snares, and um, we'll see those. The uh, the plants of the snares are fascinating as well. The the, the forest cover on the snares is um, a tree daisies, so there's Olaria and Brachyglottis, um, and you'll see those, um, and, and as well things like the Anisotomy, um, a number of the other species like the silver carpers that are all endemic or, or very much um, confined to the snares and, and just a small number of, of the islands to the south of the uh, of, of, of Stewart Island. The uh, the one thing that we, we don't see from the zodiacs, but the snares also has um, has a great diversity of, is invertebrates, things like um, weevils and slugs that have Probably been on the snares since it was connected to the uh, to the mainland, wow. and um, <clears> have <throat> been left there as uh, as isolated little remnant <laughs> populations trapped, trapped exactly <laughs> on the snares. <laughs> so, of those um, endemic species that only exist there, what is the likelihood we're going to see some of them from the zodiac? So, from the uh, the zodiac, I mean, other than the uh, the invertebrates, I've I've over the years seen almost all the other endemic species. The things like the uh, the penguins, um, the the um, the seabirds. Even the tomtit and the fernbird we regularly see during the, uh, the course of the, uh, the zodiac cruises. There is a, a species of, uh, of snipe which is found on the, uh, the snares. Um, they're renowned for being secretive. We definitely don't see them all the time, but I have even seen the snipe um, from the zodiacs because oh. we're, we're, um, 
really just leaving nature to uh, to its own course. And so uh, a snipe wandering through the forest can um, can be spotted on occasions, and of course the plant life growing along the, uh, the shores of the island as well. Excellent. So I hear there's a penguin slide there too. It sounds very cool. How much fun is this? <laughs> well, I don't know if it's too much fun for the penguins, but it's absolutely <laughs> spectacular for um, for us. So it's around on the uh, the northern end of the island, and um, these uh, snares crested penguins actually breed up in the interior of the island. So they um, they land on um, on this great granite slope, and then it's about 120 meters elevation. They walk. Sort of, uh, and you can actually see where their claw marks over the over the millennia have worn away at the uh, the granite, and they make their way all the way up and over the top and into where their uh, their breeding colonies are. So um, the, the plan isn't to slide, but it definitely looks like it's uh, a slide when you sit at the bottom of the zodiacs and watch the action. <laughs> so you've been visiting the snares since you were a boy. What can you tell us about your first experience? Um, uh, my first experience of the snares, I guess, like just the, uh, and, and I think for for me and for for most people that visit the snares, is just that. That sheer abundance of life that overwhelms you as you uh, as you come in towards the uh, the island, and you really get a sense for just how abundant the snares are, but how abundant the the life of the Southern Ocean is when you see it concentrated around one of those pristine breed predator free breeding islands. Excellent. So, since then, how many times have you visited? How many times I've I've uh, lost count of how many times I've visited the snares. It's um it's a feature of our of of all of our sub Antarctic voyages. So um somewhere which I um, yeah have come to know well and, and really enjoy. And any day would uh, be I'm very happy to find myself at the uh, at snares. One of your favourites. Yes. And that also includes living there for six weeks over winter. Not sure how um, smart that was. How did all that come about? So um. I was fortunate enough to travel through the Sub-Antarctic Islands during um, during my time as a, as a young lad, and um, that led to a really a, an interest and a passion for for the science of the region as um, as well. So um, when I was at university looking for for projects, um, I um, through conversations and discussions was able to, um, to to be involved in an ongoing project with the the Bullers Albatross Research, which is a, a long term study of the uh, the albatross that's been. Um, ongoing since the 1940s, in fact, oh, okay. from the uh, from the snares. So, um, and, and it gave me an opportunity to, uh, to to experience another side of the snares, which was the the winter and um, and on land, um, having visited many times during the summer. So, and how would you compare the winter and the summer? Um, so, I mean, this is some really obvious differences between summer and, and winter. One, of course, is that the days are, are short. You're you're well to the south of. Um, of, mm. uh, and, and so the days um, are, are distinctly short during the middle of, um, of winter. There's um, some quite noticeable differences in terms of the, uh, the wildlife as um, well. Things like the snares crested penguins and the sooty shearwaters have left, um, but the bullers albatross are really in full swing um, with their chick raising during the winter, which is why I was there um, during the winter. And um, climatically, you might think uh, winter in the Southern Ocean is, um, is absolutely horrible. Um, it's definitely not the uh, the pick of the time to be there, but um, it's surprisingly stable, the climate. So we average sort of between zero and five degrees Celsius each day on the um, on the island. So a nice constant. No nice su- and constant. No surprises. Yeah, no, you always knew what you were in for. <laughs> Somewhere between zero and five and maybe a little bit of rain, um, but um, it would always pass through quickly. And were you on any particular island or several? Yeah, so we were the, um, there's, there's a small research base um, or hut on the main Snares Islands, on the main island, and so we lived in that, um, that research base, um, which is comprised of, of several small um, huts, and then the, uh, the research sites, the albatross sites, um, study colonies, um, were on that main island as, um, as well. Okay, so what was the rationale behind studying the Bullard's albatross? So I, I guess that what I um, got really interested in and involved with was um, was evolutionary responses to um, to the to the environment and um, particularly particularly things around um, sex allocation theory and, and evolutionary responses to to changes of resources in the um, in the environment. Um, the I, obviously I had a, had a strong interest in, in researching the seabirds and the life of the uh, the Southern Ocean, but there's some really interesting um, ideas around the um, the the responses of a long-lived species, an albatross will live to 60, 65 years of um, of age. So um, because the population on the snares had been studied for so long, there was no one age birds through, throughout the age spectrum from, from sort of the, the grandparents in their 60s um, through to young first-time breeders. Um, and that, that known po- um, population um, and, and age population enabled us to start looking into um, into things like do do adults or do the do the uh, do the birds change their 
um, sex allocation of, of offspring in response to the, the age of the, the parents and, and the resources available in the environment and some of those sorts of, um, of questions. That's uh, very specific. It is, it is. <laughs> well, um, with the ultimate findings of your studies? So um, what we we looked at was, was a um, first of all, was how much food was required to raise a male or a female chick. Um, and, I mean, the, the, the hypothesis was that a, a male albatross um, is about 10% larger than a female at, at, at adulthood, so um, that a, ch- a male chick should take more um, energy for the parents to uh, to to be able to raise, um, and the findings of, of of the work that I was involved in and, and did was that that is indeed the case. That take uh, the adults raising a, a male chick need to bring more food ashore. Um, they're, they're feeding it more regularly as well. So um, to raise a male chick is, is energetically more expensive yeah. than, than raising a female chick. Um, we then looked at whether the um, the, the the parents which were um, more inexperienced, so maybe the, the first time breeders or the older birds were were, were more likely to have um, female chicks because they're energetically a little bit easier to um, to, to successfully fledge, um, and and that requires a large data set. From the uh, the years work that I did, the uh, the data is is tending to indicate that they that is the case that that alb- albatross and bullers breed. Every year, so each year for from about when they're somewhere between 10 and 15 through until potentially into their 60s, but when they're younger and experienced birds and when they're older um, and, and getting near the end of their, their breeding life, um, they're more likely to have female chicks, whereas during the, uh, the prime of their breeding um, life, they're more likely to raise um, male chicks. And they're able to control the sex. So the question is the mechanism of, of how. Um, age. The, <laughs> age. Um, so the, the, um, the, there's a lot of evidence, and, and from a number of different species, that, that there is a mechanism, and it's an innate mechanism. It's not that the female is going, this year I'm going to have a have a female chick. But I innate... need a break. <laughs> Those boys are hard work. <laughs> exactly. Innately, somehow there's a response to the environment or, or, or environmental cues um, that are making them more likely. And it's not a 100% female or male. It's just a, a statistically more uh, significantly one or the other. Um, that there, so there is some degree of, of response to environment um, that's an innate control. That's, um, and, and no one's exactly sure what that mechanism is um, to date. Um, but the fact that it's happening indicates that there is some sort of mechanism to, to, to bias the sex ratios. Oh, wow. And so you've got to further some other continue on some important research into these birds. Yeah, no one had really looked at in a long-lived species. Like There's sort of the studies that we were working off um, and in terms of sort of comparing um, similar research with, with people who studied populations of sparrows and um, warblers, thing, uh, species which are short-lived and have quite a short reproductive cycle. Um, no one had had the opportunity to look at that in a, a long-lived species, um, let alone a long-lived sea, seabird as, um, as, as a comparison and test some of those theories and hypotheses against uh, which when you're like a sparrow and you live for two or three years, they're quite different to an albatross that's living exactly. for 60. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. And who were you sharing the island with um, people was? So um, for the bulk of the time that I was on the island, there was three of us living on the, um, on the island. Um, it was my, uh, my supervisor, Paul Sager, who worked um, for, for NIWA and it was the sort of the, the, uh, the lead scientist or is the, uh, the lead scientist with the, uh, the Bullers Albatross um, work and we had, um, had one um, field assistant with us as, um, as well. So just the three of us that were, um, were based on the island throughout the, uh, the majority of, uh, of our time. And um, we're actually joined by um, by Kennedy Warren from New Zealand Geographic, um, who was um, doing some work on the uh, some um, articles around the, uh, the the research that Paul had been involved Excellent. in. Excellent. So there's um, that information's out there now. It is. Yeah. yeah. No, Kennedy's a fantastic writer, and uh, he's uh, he's written, he wrote an excellent article on the uh, the ongoing work around the uh, the Bullers Albatross, including a little part of what what I was involved in as well. <laughs> For posterity. Yes. Um, and so what sort of logistics were involved in living on the snares for six weeks? So um, I mean, to get to the snares in the middle of winter, you, um, you, there's, not re- there's no regular transport. So we, uh, we made our way down to, to uh, Invercargill and then waited for a, a weather window. Um, and we, we actually went down with, the, um, with um, one of the Stewart Island ferries that had been chartered specifically to, to take us to, um, to the snares. Um, the backup plan, if the weather didn't allow, um, allow us to leave by boat at the end, um, was that we'd have to leave by, um, by helicopter. But luckily yeah. the weather was, um, was suitable and so the boat was able to come back and pick us up at the end of the, uh, the six weeks. In terms of living on the island, it's, um, 
it's, it's very comfortable, but it's quite simple in terms of the, uh, the existence. There's no hot running water or, or anything like that, so no showers while we're on the island. For six uh, weeks. For six weeks, yep. Um, you've got to be dedicated to, uh, to your Southern Ocean research. With wipes. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's cold. Um, you're all living yeah. in, the, in the same, uh, same space, so, um, there's a, there's a composting toilet on the island. Um, we had, um, gas there for, uh, for cooking, but, we're, most days from dawn to dusk, you're out in the in the field, um, doing research, and then just returning to the uh, to the field base for the um, for the nights. Oh, okay, excellent. And could you walk us through a typical day of when you are one on one with the albatross? Yeah, so for for me, the days would sort of get going. Would leave the uh, the field base while it was still dark, because what I wanted to know was when the chicks were getting fed by the um, by the adults. So we'd, um, it was about a twenty minute walk through the um, across the island through the old Illyria forest in the dark to be at the the colony, the study colony at dawn, um, and then what we would do is first thing in the morning and, and last thing at night, we'd weigh 30 chicks, which were part of the uh, the study population, um, and then during the course of the day, there was a lot of sitting and, and watching and waiting um, to see when the adults were returning, and each adult would be feeding every sort of three to five days they would um, return, so some days there was a, a very small number of, of feeds that would happen, other days there was a more more adults returning and, and feeding, we'd record um which of the adults were feed, had fed the chick, um, and, um, and when, and then with those weights at either end of the day, we were able to, uh, to calculate the volume and the, the weight of the food that the, uh, the chicks had been fed, um, by each of the, um, the adults, which was all part of building up the picture as to how energetically expensive it is to, exactly. to raise a chick. <clears throat> and how did you guys spend the evenings? Um, so, I mean, was, there was a good amount of sort of updating all the data that you collected during the day um, and then a lot of conversations. There's plenty of time in a winter's <laughs> evening to put the world to rights during a few, few good conversations. So it sounds like there was a lot of animal wrangling involved in this. What sort of techniques did you develop for this? So um, I, I guess to, to catch an albatross you need to, um, or, or to pick up an albatross, you need to um, to look after it in a, um, and be very respectful of the um, of the bird. So um, we always worked with with bare hands so that we're not um, we're not sort of overly clumsy or, or rough with the um, with the albatross. Um, making sure that you've got the bill under control because the bill is um, nice and, and sharp for um, for what they do when they're out at sea and, and catching prey, and um, and also keeping those wings under control because an albatross is um, when it gets those wings unfurled, um, <laughs> it can get um, get flight take flight quite easily in a gentle southern ocean breeze. So um, mm. I guess yeah, holding the holding the bird, you tuck it under your wing, under your uh, their wings under right. your arm, um, and then the other hand to uh, to hold the uh, the bill and, and keep it sort of so you contained. Your wing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, now, speaking of the shark beak, beaks and hooked bills, um, there's an element of danger there. Do you have any um, war wounds? Oh, I've got a got a few albatross war wounds that have stuck with me over the um, over the years. But the uh, the great thing was that um, that even though your hands were getting quite cut up with the uh, the sharp bills. So for whatever reason, they, none of the cuts were getting infected um, living down in the, the Southern Ocean during winter. So, um, yeah, right. they, they've just a, a few war, war wounds to stick with me for through the years. <laughs> Excellent. And so these guys are getting pretty hard by ingesting plastic waste these days. How, did you notice much of that when you were on the island? Yeah, I mean, what we were obviously we were watching the the, the adults feeding the chicks, um, and then often the chicks, if there was something that they couldn't digest, were regurgitating that. So you'd see the uh, the, the the natural things like the squid beaks that they um, that they'd regurgitate, but we did also see things like matchsticks um, being regurgitated, um, and and the sort of those little bits of plastics that um, that were identifiable that the adults had obviously picked up during their foraging and, and thought it was food, and then fed it to the uh, their chicks. But you'd see it sort of around the edge of the nests is the most likely places that you'd um, come across it. Okay, so not good back then either. No, no, no <laughs> not good, not good, not great, no. So a question probably everyone's um, thinking, did you, do you have any My Octopus Teacher type connections to share? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess the uh, My Octopus Teacher is a, is a, is a fascinating kind of uh, look into the, um, into the, to the relationship with, with a with a, a wild animal and nothing particularly no one um, one bird but I think um, just the opportunity to spend that much time getting to know the um, know the birds in the colony and and the species as a whole you really get an appreciation for for just how their life works and and how how well adapted they are to um to life in in the southern ocean it's they're completely at home in that environment. Thanks, So looking back, what's your most vivid or memorable? experience from that time 
I think, I mean, just a, a few things, but um, the the opportunity to spend time working with the albatross and really just observing them, taking time to um, to really understand them and appreciate them, but also just the, the beauty of living in the Southern Ocean and, and seeing the um, the changing of the, the days and the weather moving through and, and just the, the rhythms of life in the, on, a, on, a, on a seabird island. Yeah, on a, yeah. On a daily. On a daily basis. What a, yeah. what a privilege. Um, so how would you say the snares have changed since you were a, a young boy, um, a snares islander and now an expedition leader <laughs> over those years? I, fundamentally, I actually haven't seen any major changes to the snares. Like the snares is, um, is still pristine. It's still one of those incredibly wildlife-rich islands. I mean, we see subtle change every time we visit. No two days at, at the snares are ever the same. I found that when I was living on the island, when we visit with the uh, with the ship and the Zodiac cruising. Um, and that's one of the great things about the snares and the Southern Ocean is that it is so dynamic. Um, but while that those protections are in place, it actually has um, ensured that the islands have, have remained really quite um, pristine. So we aren't seeing the major changes that, that are impacting on perhaps some of the other areas that we um, we visit. Okay, so, so you have three words to convince anybody that's sitting on the fence whether they would like to visit this news or not, why, why they should go. <laughs> I don't know whether <laughs> it's three, I don't know whether it's three, but I, I'd say one of the most amazing places in the world. Like, you really okay. can't, um, can't, I can't think of anywhere more amazing than the snares. And you've been to some amazing places. I've been to, to many amazing places. <laughs> most There's of lots... them, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you for sharing your amazing adventures. You've heard it here, people. The Snares, place to be this summer. Hundreds of thousands of seabirds can't be wrong. Um, we would um, kick over to any comments that you guys or questions that you might have now, so feel free to fire them in. Um, while we're looking at that, maybe we could talk about the trips that um, people can see the sne- visit the Snares on. Yeah, so for um, for Heritage Expeditions, our um, our summer season in the in the Southern Antarctic Islands starts in in November and um, and runs through until um, till March. And the uh, the snares is very much a um, a big part of the um, the the itineraries for for all of our expeditions. They're um, they're a real feature for for some of our expeditions that um, say head down to the Ross Sea region of Antarctica, which we do during January and February. Um, I think many people are caught by surprise by the snares. They've, they've, they've come along to visit the Antarctic and, 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 um, and they've probably read a lot about what Antarctica has in store for them and the snares are sort of something like a, stop, a stepping stone on the way. Um, I, my experience is that those stepping stones, the snares, the, the, the Auckland Islands, they become real highlights for, um, for people because there is so much available there in terms of I mean, natural history and, and history. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the sort of the rhythm of our of our season in the south is that um, during um, November and December to early January, our expeditions range from from uh, seven to, to eighteen days in um, in length, um, visiting a number of the sub Antarctic islands. Then during um, during January and February, the uh, the voyages head south, um, visiting those sub Antarctic islands once again, but also continuing down to the um, to the Ross Sea region. Of, um, of Antarctica, and then um, just for this year, because um, it's, everything's a little bit different with the um, with the world this year. <laughs> Thank um, you, David. Uh, yes, we've also um, just <laughs> recently launched a, a new expedition for early January, um, which is going to visit um, the um, the Snares, but also Stewart Island and Fiordland. So, an excellent opportunity for um, for New Zealanders to to explore um, the beauty of the fjords, the I guess the uh, the diversity of um, of Stewart Island, and um, and include what I think is, is one of the most amazing sub Antarctic islands with the snares um, in that um, that time on board as um, as well. So a really a, a great series of, of contrasting New Zealand islands um, in one expedition. Okay, thank you very much. Lots of options to get to the snares. Um, we have no questions. I don't think that's because you don't have any questions. <laughs> I think that. Um, Facebook has just done an upgrade, and that might be the problem, um, or it could be operator error. Um, so either we've been too thorough. Or maybe or we answered Facebook, all the questions. I think we might have, yeah. So we might call it there. If you do have any questions, feel free to um, email them into us at info at heritage-expeditions.com, and we will answer them for you. Unfortunately, we're unable to do it in this forum. Um, so that's a wrap. Thank you so much for joining us on our first um, live discussion. Hope you enjoyed it, and keep an eye out for our next one. We'll announce that shortly, and until next time, safe travels. Great. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us. And, and like Isaac Thanks. says, look out for the, um, for, the, for the next ones. We've got um, plenty more planned. Cool people, too.
Exactly. <laughs> Bye.